would love to start with each of you just sharing a little bit about your own background and what led you to the boardroom. And if you could share that in your own words, that would be best. So let's start with you, Shelley. Sure. So I um, did not make a deliberate decision to be on boards. I worked on Wall Street for about 35 years. Uh, investing in companies that either needed an operating turnaround or that needed their balance sheet restructured. And so after I left Wall Street, a family office that I had done investing with started putting me on the boards of those kinds of companies. And I rapidly understood why board you know, work uh, is so popular and why men are holding on to those positions like, you know, with a death grip. Um, you know, they're very, very uh, helpful. Um, I was on a board with a guy who um, retired as a CEO 30 years ago. He'd done very well. And for the last 30 years, he's done nothing but be on boards. And so it's very attractive for a number of reasons. One, it's intellectually engaging and challenging. Um, it is an opportunity to stay relevant. If you're earlier in your career, you're C-suite or aspiring to C-suite, it's a chance to observe and participate participate in decision making at a very high level. Um, it's a chance to influence policy. So I'm in the boardroom, you know, what's the maternity leave policy? And it's a chance to hire a diverse group of professionals. So boards use um, law firms, they use auditors, they use accountants, and every time it's a parade of guys. And so you know, one director I spoke with said, you know what, I say when we're changing audit firms or the audit professional changes, I'd like to see a diverse group of candidates. That's that's something that we can do for other women, and that's something that we can do for our daughters. It's lucrative. You get fees, and then you also you know, get equity, and you make great contacts. I'm starting a, a venture capital secondary fund with a friend, and the first person we pitched was somebody I had met through a board. So I understand that's the whys of why you would want to do it, uh, and how I did it. it was a little bit different. From other people, but those are some of the whys. Oh, I love that. All those whys, just uh, really powerful and completely spot on. So thank you so much. Shelly, Lisa, how about you? So I spent 20 years on Wall Street. I was at Goldman Sachs. I was a partner there, and I had a very eclectic career um, to the extent that I didn't kind of rise up in one vertical. I was in equity sales and trading and international equities. I was in compliance, legal, and audit, and then I ran Goldman's brand during the financial crisis. So when I picked up my head and decided to leave Goldman Sachs, board work was not on my mind at all. No one had spoken with me about it, and this was, you know, I, I re retired, not the right word, in, in 2015, and even that recently, no one had sort of coached or mentored me or suggested that board work was something that I should do. It was actually a phone call from a business school section mate of mine who um, works at an institutional investment firm uh, and is a portfolio manager and finds that you know, diversity is really important to him. He's starting to hear that from his shareholders. He cares about it in his companies. Heard I was leaving Goldman where I had not been able to serve on a board and said, Lisa, I really want you to be on the board of a company that I am invested in. And I'm going to go through my portfolio. I'm going to look at the companies I think most highly of the CEOs at those companies, I think most highly of. And then um, of those, the ones that have done the worst job of diversity on their management teams or diversity in their boardrooms. And I'm just going to start introducing you. Is that OK? And that was my wake up call to thinking about uh, joining boards. And thanks to an introduction that he made to um, a, a, a brilliant man named Bruce Flatt, who was the C is still the CEO of Brookfield Asset Management. Um, I met him, still wasn't really sure about boards. He didn't have a board opportunity at the time, but six weeks later he did. And it was a very interesting um, phone call that I got uh, where he was offering me the opportunity to interview for a board called Brookfield Property Partners, um, where I didn't know anything about real estate and I had never served on a board. So like a good girl, I was sure to tell him I've never served on a board before. Is that going to be okay? And he's a contrarian anyway that basically said, you are a partner at Goldman Sachs. That's good enough for me. I don't need another board hiring you to tell me that you're good enough. And that's a topic we'll come back to, I'm sure. Um, second, I reminded him that I didn't know anything about real estate. He said, don't be silly. We know what we need to know about real estate. We, know, we need to know the expertise that you bring, whether it's marketing, reputation, crisis, financial markets, whatever it might be. 
Um, and, uh, you know, would you please join the board? Now, when I joined, I was the only woman on the board, so that was clearly a factor, but um, it was a really uh, great entree into the boardroom for me that way unexpectedly, which is uh, a very important relationship aspect of getting on boards. Amazing. Um, I spent uh, 34 years at Ernst & Young, EY, one of the big four firms. There, I ran an $8 billion business. I also led 20 IPOs in four different countries, brands you would recognize, and did over five, 25 transactions internationally. Um, so I have the financial expertise, and women on boards was something that, you know, everyone's looking for. So after mandatory retirement from EY, for all of the why reasons, including being a lifelong learner, I certainly didn't want to retire. And I thought this was a good way to stay curious, stay active, and be involved. So um, many of the boards that, you know, we'll talk about, you know, they have various committees of the board, which is a really good place to start, by the way. You know, really understanding what the composition is and what the tasks are. So then you can build your resume and skill set to those committees and just overall strategically position yourself for that. But in any, any event, uh, they usually put me on the audit committee, which uh, I enjoy because I, I think you have to know the financials inside and out of a company, regardless of what area you're in, even if you're in marketing, you know, you got to know how, how the money's made. And, um, and uh, also, you know, my, my interests lie in growth, strategic growth, and that just seemed to be a good fit. So the bottom line was, you know, I retired from ENY, but I, I didn't want to be retired. And board work was just a great extension of keeping active. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so now let's dig a little deeper into the how. So, you know, what are the proactive steps that you can take to either initiate, so maybe it's that very first board opportunity, or advance and grow a, a for-profit board career? So I'd really like to dive into, you know, practical advice, but also how should you be thinking about it? So Shelly, I want to start with you. I, I want to hear a little bit about some of the creative ways that you have thought about leveraging private board seats, uh, advisor seats, in order to really grow and advance a, a board career? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of ways to come at it. Um, I think a private company board is a great first step. You know, I went straight onto a public company board, but private company boards are a great first step. Um, I think what you need to think about is what your value proposition is. So I'm a finance person, I guess, like both of these ladies, Lisa and Maria. And so even when it's a company that's not in trouble, like I'm on the board of a company that just did an IPO, um, my value add is I'm usually on the audit committee or chair of the audit committee. Uh, my other value add is, you know, restructuring, balance sheet, you know, capital allocation, et cetera. So know what your value add is uh, and then network. Um, I use every opportunity to network. I join groups like Fourth Floor. Um, private companies are a great place to start and tell people. Um, you know, it's women sometimes will hesitate to put their ask out there, and I've gotten better about just asking and just saying, hey, you know, I'm interested. Um, and telling kind of everybody, you know, particularly people who are in a position to help. So I think, you know, the networking, I can't say enough about it. Every board role I've found after my initial one, and this is kind of my fifth board, is has been uh, the result of knowing somebody else on the board who would refer me to someone. Um, you know, every, like, Bed Bath & Beyond, I knew somebody who knew somebody, and that's how I ended up on the board. Absolutely. Great insights. Okay, so Lisa, lots of people talk about this chicken and egg conundrum, which you alluded to previously, which has kept women out of the Canada pipeline historically, i.e. you aren't deemed qualified to sit on a board if you have not sat on a board. So thank goodness it's starting to change, but maybe you can speak a little bit about how to effectively leverage your skill sets um, when maybe you haven't sat on a board before. So um, I want to build on, on Shelly's great comments and I guess add, add my own um, experience to it. So I think every board that I've been on has come about because of a relationship. So the odds are, and I think the, the study that was done said it was either 84 or 85% of the time, your board relationship is going to come about from someone that you already know. You already know right now who's going to put you on a board. So the question is, how do you think about it? 
And most people just want to put up, you know, the flair that says, I'm interested in board work to everyone in their network. And that might be fine. But what you really want to do is think about who, to Shelley's point, who do you know that is in the flow of board opportunities? Because they're a PE firm, a, a VC firm person. They're a CEO, a founder, a banker, an accountant, a lawyer, another board director, a search professional. Who is it that you already know that knows you that would feel comfortable with a little ad additional, you know, pitch a few bullet points from you to, to put you onto the shortlist, to make you considerable um, for, uh, for someone looking for a board director? Make it easy for them. Reach out to them. Look at your network and say, who are 10 people that, that fit into this zone who know me? who would feel comfortable with a little bit of extra information about what I want to go out there and represent me and, and advocate for me when it comes to board opportunities that they know about. Most people aren't strategic about this. Start with 10, go to the next 10, go to the next 10, and just start reconnecting and make sure those people are activated on your behalf. Um, so I think, I think that is the most important thing. The other thing I'll just say as a quick refinement is to Shelley's point, it's important that you position yourself, but do so not on the basis of here are all the things I've done in my career. And here they are chronologically because we're all sort of made to think like that. Instead, look at what are the risks that boards are dealing with now? What are the top 10 risks? And usually at the beginning of a year, like accounting firms and search firms are publishing these reports that say, here is what... Um, boards are, are viewed, uh, viewing as the, as the biggest risks. What do you bring to the table that addresses those risks such that when you're interviewing with me for a board seat, you're answering the question of how are, how are you going to de-risk the room for me and why should I want you sitting next to me? Relevant to the board position, not necessarily a recitation of everything you've done in your career that may or may not relate to those risks. Uh, I love that, Lisa, so well said. Yeah, thank you. So Maria, how about you? Do you have some practical advice, uh, to, uh, tangible tips about the how? Yeah, I mean, this is all great advice. You know, obviously, uh, outstanding. Networking, sure, it's important. You know, I'd recommend uh, group, joining groups, you know, like fourth level, like the Women's Worth Board Foundation or symposium, I think is an excellent way to start. Um, if you're really interested in board work, consider getting certified. The NACD has a certification program. You can add that to your list of being accredited. Um, I really think that, you know, you think logically about uh, giving, you know, because Actually, you know, if you're looking for a board, you're in the position of asking, and that puts you in a position of taking. But don't forget, you know, what you're really doing is you're giving. You're going to be giving your time, your expertise, and think of it in that way. You know, and it's, it takes a while. I mean, my first board didn't land till a year, year and a half later. So be patient, but really be willing to offer what you can in the interim. And there's so many ways you can help, either through your network or your expertise or, or maybe making a connection. So I would say start working on the board position in advance of getting the position. I, I, I love that uh, insight about being in the position of taking, but if you're thinking about giving, it just it strengthens a, a, the value prop that you present. I mean, I think that's just really insightful. So thank you for sharing that. And I can't believe how quickly the time goes. We are at final takeaways. So I would love to go to you first. Shelly, do you have a final takeaway for everyone in this room thinking about the how and the why and your boardroom journey? So really quickly, just to reiterate something you said, which was excellent. I was on the phone with someone yesterday. She's a lawyer. She did a lot of real estate. And we walked through what her value added was in terms of commercial real estate is challenged right now. And, um, you know, she, I said, look, contacts at law firms, contacts with professionals, contacts with PE firms, anybody from your past, you need to get out there. So I thought that was great. She's in a sweet spot right now. And so I thought that was, you know, a great way for her to kind of figure out how to do this. One of my takeaways is just like Maria said, be patient. 
Um, you know, when I first got on the board, people said to me, oh, my God, you're a woman, a black woman on a board. People will be beating down your door. That didn't happen at all. Um, it is you have to be patient. Like I said, there, there are not a lot of spots and the guys are holding on to them like this and they refer their friends. So it's not it's not like they're you know, you can go on the street and pick up a board spot. It just doesn't work like that. Um, so be patient. And the other thing that I would say is that before as you're being patient, kind of prep not just the certifications and understanding what boards do, but get together with women who are on boards to understand. I walked into my first board role. I came from Wall Street, trading floors. People are yelling at each other. They're yelling at you. You know, I walked into the boardroom and I was always the only woman, except for Bed Bath & Beyond, or the only black person. And so it was, it took somebody like Elisa to say to me, okay, don't say it that way. You know, say it this way, you know? And so that's the kind of thing that the, the men on the board never said to me. They just kind of, if I was yelling or whatever, they rolled their eyes and they kept it moving. Lisa and the other women who had been on the boards were the ones who said to me, okay, now that you've landed a seat, this is kind of how you operate. So, Love it. Your turn, Lisa. Um, I think that in the spirit of being patient for getting a board opportunity, and hopefully you have many opportunities to consider, do your due diligence. If you are in a position to join a board, it's like a marriage. It's not easy to get off a board. And so remember that when you are interviewing for a board opportunity, you are interviewing them. And don't get caught up in, I so want to be on a board, I'll take whatever board opportunity there is without you know, paying attention to, does this smell right? Why are they in such a hurry to get someone? Why are they willing to take someone who's never been on a board before? Ask the questions, because you don't want to get yourself into a situation where you realize afterwards that you're potentially liable. You realize afterwards that you've walked into a hornet's nest, or you realize afterwards that um, you know, there were questions that you could have asked. So it's, it's kind of a juggle between uh, patience and due diligence. Love that. Maria, bring us home. Sure. Um, I really like the network, network, network one. Everyone tells you that, but you already know that, right? I mean, that's why you're here. But here's something practical I think you can use. Google it. You can even go to Disney, go to any companies, board skill matrix, okay? Look at all the skills they list. Just have a look at them and say, okay, do I have these skills? If you're convinced that you don't have them, talk yourself out of it. Go and talk to someone else about your skill set. Just be prepared. You know, know the company you're dealing with. Know the skills they're looking for. And, you know, you said bring it home. Bring it home by putting your skills against that matrix because everyone in here is qualified to do that. Love it. Thank you so much.